Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to start this session with a, a small land acknowledgement. Uh, I am, uh, you know, coming to you from Vancouver in Canada, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunt Camino speaking Musqueam people. This land has always been a part of uh, learning for Musqueam who have been here since the last ice age about 10,000 years ago and who have lived in close knit Musqueam community since about 4,000 years who have survived and remain strong and distinct with their cultural practices, despite the devastating impacts of various effects to assimilate them. Uh, this ancestral unceded territory, the lands and the waters of the Hunt Camino speaking Musqueam people continue to support their cultural and economic practices while serving as a source of knowledge and memory encoded with their teachings. On this land, the Musqueam people have successfully passed on their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next. Uh, with this, uh, I'd like to uh, you know, share a brief introduction about our speaker today. Uh, our speaker is former Chief, uh, uh, chief Lee Crochild. Uh, he has been the former chief of the uh, Stutina First Nations. Uh, chief Crochild is an environmentalist, writer, hunter, and ceremonialist. As the chief from 2016 to 2019, he held the elected position with responsibility for all, all aspects of his nation's well being, development, and representation. He's a sought after speaker who has given presentations, speeches, and attended panels for a variety of corporate and political meetings, events including Environment of Canada, Alberta Environment, Bow River, Watershed Conservancy, uh, Assembly of First Nations, to name a few. He's often asked for media commentary on issues, uh, current issues, uh, and one of his recent interviews on CTV in Canada uh, inspired the inner thought behind this conversation. Uh, he's also had board uh, positions, including APTN News, Board of Directors, and was the chairman of the board of the Making Treaty 7 Cultural okay. Society. I'm me, Andy. Um, sorry, could you please uh, mute yourself? Uh, uh, um, Chief Lee Crochild is the third generation of Crochild Chiefs. Uh, the Crochild name is acknowledged in Calgary's Crochild Trail. Uh, Chief Crochild is a man of the people and knows that serving the First Nations people requires diligence, sacrifice, and great earnestness. Uh, he is passionate about the issues of the younger generation as a father of four daughters, two sons, and four grandchildren. Uh, Chief Lee Crochild has shared his perspectives at various IFC uh, uh, conferences and occasions. He shared a story where once when no one else came to their help, MRA and some members of Song of Asia showed great courage and helped them fight fire. Uh, the Crochild family has been involved with MRA IFC since 1959, when Chief Lee's grandparents, along with Chief Walking Buffalo and other members of the family, were challenged by Frank Bookman to take the vision of building unity between nations by changing the hearts of men on a world journey of two, to 13 countries. Today's session is a conversation on understanding the significance of the Pope's historic visit to Canada and his apology for the unmarked graves of indigenous children and the political impact, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the potential impact of this event on all future generations through an ind indigenous perspective. Uh, before I start the session, I would like to reiterate for all of you who have joined us recently, uh, there is a English to French and French to English interpretation available. If you uh, go to the bottom uh, panel, the control panel of your Zoom screen and select the globe icon, uh, you will be given options to be able to select each of those channels for going ahead with the session. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, you know, invite Chief Lee Crochild uh, starting off with a question uh, uh, in terms of you know, just getting us uh, attuned to the context of this session. Uh, so Chief uh, Crochild, uh, what was the significance and the assumptions of the treaties 
uh, were the treaties followed and honored by all involved? What were the effects? First of all, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm very honored to be, be here. Sit, um, and I, I see a lot of old friends there. The one that comes up is Freddie there. It's been many years, Freddie. And um, you, know, you, you had more hair before. That's all I can say. But it's been really good to meet everybody. Um, you know, I, I, as we're preparing for all of this, I'm going through a, lo a lot of thoughts about how do I deliver content? And, and like Kesa says, I've done, I've done lots of presentations to various organizations and that. Not that that was ever my, my intention, it just turns out like that. And, and here's another one. But this one, this one is different because I'm talking to, to people who actually shared a, a common vision. I think all of you that are listening in and watching, you know we, we kind of all share this common vision about creating change. The challenge is how we get there. Everybody that's listening in, I notice for, for the most part, they're, um, we're, we've all become rather senior. You know, um, and I've, I've thought about this a lot. I'm, I'm gonna tell you my own story before we get to any actual questions. You know, when um, IFC, well, MRA at that time, was involved. I mean, they certainly had their own way of seeing the world. That, that, that way of seeing the world was based on, on their Christian values. Um, so presented that way. And in the age of my grandparents and, and all of those at that time, you know, for the majority of them are, are just right out of residential schools or their life was being influenced by residential schools. So to be involved with um, and this world journey and everything, and Frank Bookman and that, it, it was, it's a historical snapshot of what it was like at that time. It, it has evolved since then. And I think that, and I hope that it still continues to evolve to become much more than what it was in its, in its infancy. I'm not sure how many years we've been involved now, 70 years, 70 plus years, 75, whatever that number is. I believe that in order to survive as human beings, and I don't really care whether you're who you are, black, white, red, um, Christian, non-Christian, what male, female, it doesn't matter to me. What matters is this idea of, of, of um, how we preserve ourselves and live in harmony with, with, the, with the land, with the water, with the air, because that's really, at the heart of everything in that. Because we can pray all we want. We can try and be socially conscious all we want. Yeah, but if we're not taking care of, of this of this precious um, land that's given to us, then Mother Nature itself will say, I really don't need you guys around anymore, so I'm gonna get rid of you and we'll, we'll start all over again. That's just the reality. Having said that, we don't we don't see ourselves as caretakers of the land or protectors of the water or anything like that. Because really the, the earth, Mother Earth really doesn't need us. We're, we're kind of like parasites that she just tolerates right now. So that creates this area of humbleness. You know, and, and that removes um, any kind of preconceived ideas we have about what treaties were in that because I have to take us back that far in order to start talking about what, what treaties were. The intention of treaties maybe mm -hmm. at that time was for the for government, for, for settlers, for anybody else that came, was to ensure their safety, was to find ways to have access to resource, because it's all about resource. Um, it was never really about humanity to be um, seen as equals. All it was, it was there was mm -hmm. land here and it was good land and it could make us prosper. It could, you know, we just gotta do something with these, about these, all these indigenous people that live on this land and say it's theirs. So that's how treaties became involved. 
Okay, so that was the assumption of that. On, on our side, I think for the most part, we just realized that making war, because we, we heard the stories of what happened in the United States was, was not, what, was not the, the way to go. It was, um, leadership had to be more proactive. Mm -hmm. So we went to the agreements. When, when the runners came out and says, there's a signing of treaty here, we want you all to show up to it. Um, people did. The nations came into this camp. In our area, treaty said, in our area, they came to this place called Blackfoot Crossing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the non native side, they said this is a great time of celebration and all these things. And, and you know, they could hear the drumming all night <clears throat> and all these things. So, th their assumption was that these, these natives are really happy about, about um, signing a treaty and they're celebrating that. In reality, it was these were these were high high level meetings that were happening within the nations in that, and deciding whether they should kill all of those that came to sign the treaty or whether they should, should let them live. Mm. So perspective is different now. You know, it, it, it's not right. the it, it's not the noble the noble savage and the stalwart Northwest Mounted Police. This is all about whether we're going to kill. All of these that are sitting here ready to sign treaty or not. We have a lot of dignitaries now. Mm -hmm. So having having done that there, you know, they realized if they did kill everybody, that would be that would make everything much more harder for for, for all the nations in the future. So it was agreed that they would sign a treaty of peace, not a treaty of anything else. It was they didn't surrender any land, they didn't cede anything that it was just to ensure that nobody got killed. So they touched the pen and the, and the witness would sign on behalf of this person who touched the pen. This is his ex. <clears throat> um, so now that we've created that, that kind of difference in the narrative and that, now we can start talking about some of these, um, some of these other things. In my later okay. years, I actually, Sorry. In my later years, I was actually given this um, this chance to to have an understanding of what it means to to um, work at telling the truth. And maybe um, I say I got eight to ten minutes, and we should all stop there, and we'll go to question two. Okay. Uh, so. Thank you for sharing that background. Uh, I think my my second question is going to be around, you know, trying to go a little deeper. Uh, so the Pope recently visited Canada to apologize for the atrocities committed in the residential schools. And you shared about your mom in the CTV interview, who's also a residential school survivor. What is your take on this apology? Okay, that uh, it's not a black and white answer. I mean, I'll give you my perspective. Mm -hmm. For a lot of those that were just struggling to make it through life, an apology meant the world to them. And who am I to tell them that that's not enough? You know, well, a lot of them are satisfied and they can, they can live out the rest of their life knowing that at least somebody apologized for what happened. At a different level and with younger people, and with those that fight for a treaty and that, uh, maybe it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough because the real ask of the Pope was to rescind the doctrine of discovery. Um, I can't remember the Pope's name, but it was long in the 1400s, I believe. He made, he made this proclamation, the doctrine of discovery. Now that that came to the, the papal bulls or the policies that would follow in that. And what that, what that did, it gave Christianity and everybody else the right to claim land in the eyes of God. You're gonna claim this land because it's, it's new, it's virgin. It doesn't belong to anybody in their way of seeing possession. So of course there was a big migration that came from North America. Um, 
And every religion follows the, the doctrine of discovery, which is colonialism. Because it gives them the right to prosper wherever they see fit. So to rescind the doctrine of discovery from the Pope, um, if he had actually said that, even though they say they don't practice it anymore, it would have sent a clear signal out to that real change is going to happen. And now people are start talking about about Canadian Constitution and all and all things attached to it, without having to address what is known as the Indian Act. The Indian Act is policy that was introduced by the government of Canada when its treaty was signed. And in essence, they made us wards of the state because it fit comfortably into a Christian value system of, of making, <clears throat> of, of giving the right to send churches, churches to all of these areas to create residential schools. And I don't need to go on to that, but I'll just story on that. But why the Pope's apology was important was, was to achieve that. But he did apologize for the acts of individuals. He didn't apologize for the acts of the institution. He apologized for the acts of individuals. And that, that really did set a lot of people off. You know, why did you do just individuals? It was going to happen. And now people are start talking about, about Canadian Constitution and all and all things attached to it, without having to address what is known as the Indian Act. The Indian Act is policy that was introduced by the government of Canada when its treaty was signed, and in essence, they made us wards of the state because it fit comfortably into a Christian value system of of making <clears throat> of of giving the right to send churches, churches to all of these areas to create residential schools. And I don't need to go on to that, but I'll just story on that. But why the Pope's apology was important was, was to achieve that. But he did apologize for the acts of individuals. He didn't apologize for the acts of the institution. He apologized for the acts of individuals. And that, that really did set a lot of people off. You know, why did you do just individuals, because it's really the the doctrine of, of of what you believe as not just as Catholics, but as Christians. It doesn't matter what faith you are; you still believe in this in this idea of of, of discovery. You know, there, there are enlightened people that, that think otherwise, but for the most part, everybody just thinks about it in terms of discovery. You know, so that gives me the right to prosper on my little plot of land that I claim for myself. I my own flag there, and that's my own little country. Whether it's an apartment or, or a house or, or a mansion, that becomes your, your area that nobody can cross into. Um, my mom, you know, we, we talked about this, but I did have to talk to my mom prior to all of this about some residential school things that were, that were that she had worked on. So we start going through the list of all the laws that go through residential schools in the nation and that. And she's, she's giving me all the information, the background information on all those. And then she talked about my dad and what he went through and it was pretty ugly actually. And then she started talking about what happened to her. And, and first of all, it was a matter of fact that she tried to put distance on it. But then it became very personal because she was reliving that whole thing of what a nun had done to her. You know, and finally she just started crying and this is you know you can't do anything but just listen because it's my mom to sit there quietly it's just the two of us in the living room just sitting there quietly while she cried for a good half hour you have to say no words you have to be present because I'm, I'm her oldest son so and, and that's what he says what's this pope going to do he's not going to do anything he's just going to come and Bless a few people and do all these things that are, that fit into a, a, a Christian narrative, a narrative that's based on all these other things, colonialism and the whole thing. So that was her take on that. Um, would would I have loved to see much more? Of course, I would. I would have loved to have heard that 
that we officially send the doctrine of discovery. And I would have been able to start a, a new direction in, in, in finding a commonality. Maybe a chance to visit the Canadian Constitution and, and rewrite it and the first Asian to not be labeled under this section that's called Section 35, but to actually say, this is how we choose the rest of Canada to live on our lands. But that didn't happen. So we just continue to fight. We're, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. Everybody else moved from a different part of the world, different country. Um, North America itself, it does not have a language that speaks the land. Everybody, I'm speaking in English. That's not my language. Everybody that came to this country, they speak a different language. This is no language that's based on the values of land of North America. It's a foreign language to all of us, but it's what we use. It's what I use because that's the only way to communicate now. Uh, so I think I've used 10 minutes there, Chase. Being yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, we uh, I, I don't want to, you know, hold you up. And, uh, you know, if you feel that you're in the flow in some form, uh, please feel free to continue. Um, I think, uh, you know, you've given us some good background around this. Uh, my next question that I want to ask you is, you know, how did this, this colonialism manifest on the ground? How did it affect the indigenous families and communities? And how long did it go on for? Well, I think colonialism will continue to go on for a very long time. Maybe in my great, great, great grandchildren's time, if, if we still exist as human beings, they might say, you know, what is colonialism? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll have created a whole melting pot. We won't be separated by so much by different nations or nationalities of different tribes, but it's going to be a whole melting pot into North America. Mm -hmm. um, but in order, but to, we have to bear in mind that that's a long time. And a lot of people are still going to die from the effects of colonialism for a long time. Mm -hmm. All those that went to residential schools, a lot of them are still quite young. Some of them are still in their late thirties now. That's the last time residential schools did. So the impact of all of that still has to run its course. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a lifeblood that was injected. It was like a like a toxin that was injected into us, or a virus that that um, we, we have to we have to live with. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's um, that's just what it is. Right or wrong. Well, you know my opinion on that, but a lot of people don't see anything wrong with that. A lot of people say, well, we just got to accept that that's what's happened, you know, and adjust to it. And a lot of people do try to adjust to that. They don't, they don't see there's anything wrong because they want to fit in without having to proclaim a sense of individuality or identity that's not part of a Canadian mosaic, a melting pot. I think that probably from, from that point there, and I'm thinking about my grandsons. Um, what are they going to inherit from me? They're, they're probably, well, hopefully they'll in, inherit some kindness. I hope I showed them enough kindness to know that they have to treat people good despite. Um, because that's how I was trained. I use an example from when I was young. There's a prominent Jewish family in Calgary, a businessman, business family, and, and the, the husband got kidnapped by whoever. I don't know. Well, we used to work for that that man in his, in his field there. We used to cut the paper and everything. That he really didn't treat us that good, but we still did it because we needed the hay. And, we were doing him a service and we were collecting his, so we didn't mind that. Anyways, when he got kidnapped, my my grandfather and, and my brother and myself we were working in the field. And my grandfather says, "You better go check on the on on the people up there. You know, see how the wife is doing and everything." 
So I'm 14 years old, maybe 15. I walk up to the house and, and uh, I knock on the door and this, this, this woman, she's, young, she's an old woman now, she's in her 90s. Well, that comes to the door and I said, well, I, I'm just going to check and see how you, you're all doing. But if you guys need anything, do you need food or anything? Um, and she broke down crying. I said, no, no, we're fine. We're, we're good. Okay, then, just to make sure you guys are doing all right. So I went back to my grandfather. I told him, well, they're, you know, they said they're doing okay. So he said, all right, that's really good. You know, he said, you know, Lee, these people, they're, they're going to treat us bad everywhere you go. You know, but we have to be able to have the compassion to not be like them because they don't know anything. They, 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 they don't know how to live with the land. They don't know any of those things. So we have to we have to treat them good. Then. And so that's that's what I did. Years later, and not about five years ago, this lady comes back. She's an elderly lady, and she she told me the whole story all over again. You know, she said, I always remembered you all of these years for what you did for for us. I didn't know who you were, and that just this little boy comes up and asks us how we're doing it. If you needed anything. So that's kind of how we, I, 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 saw, I saw the world and just in, in lessons like that from my grandparents. They weren't about making big profound statements. It was just to look after the people, you know, to be, uh, to be a, a lot of, uh, uh, have a lot of compassion. Even though I would witness how non-native people would treat my grandfather with him, brutality, you know, and it was not good. But he just smiled and laughed it off. And, you know, you gotta look after these people. When I was young, it used to really make me annoyed and mad, but I live like that, and to this day, that's kind of what I do. Yeah. Um... Uh, I sort of wanted to ask you, you know, since you share this story about, you know, this this idea of intergenerational effects of colonialism on a lot of the indigenous youth and uh, that, you know, you mentioned that last survivors are still in their 30s and they're facing it. Uh, so could you share a little bit about that? The legacy that's left, you can see it every day. You know, mm -hmm. Here in Canada, and if it's everywhere, you see the legacy of, of, of what it is. Look at the incarceration rates in, in the prisons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Saskatchewan, just a, a few weeks ago, you know, thir I think it was 13 people were killed by by two young men. You know, and, and it, it didn't end well for anybody. There's no happy mm -hmm. story to that. Right. But that's of what colonialism has done because it takes away identity. It takes mm -hmm. away identity because you have to fit into a mold that was that the, the rest of the rest of your country, the rest of your community um, has shaped. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was shaped, a lot of that identity was shaped by, well, I don't want to go over and over, but by residential school, by colonialism, by imperialism. By oppression, and indigenous people just had to adjust it all to, all around the globe. It, indigenous people just had to adjust it, um, and in essence, we a lot of people became neo colonizers because they adopted those same values mm -hmm. and imposed that on their own people. So that, that's kind of the effects, and you see, even you know, um, case you said the word youth. You know, we all use the mm -hmm. word youth. And that's a very paternalistic Christian way of seeing the world. And it applies mm -hmm. to every, every other um, religion, every other belief system, the word youth. They create this whole, they, they, this whole uh, narrative on people that, well, they're not kids, but they're not adults, they're youth. And Canadian government has done it so good that in native programming, you can be a youth up to age 35, so you can qualify for youth programming. Now that's ridiculous. When I grew up, once I went through puberty and I started growing hair where there was no hair before, um, became a man. 
and I was treated as such by my by my uncles, my dad, my parents, my grandparents, my aunties. You know, I was a pretty stupid young man, but I was still a man. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. now, we always have these youth forums and these youth programs and that. And I look at them and in my in my way of seeing the world, that youth is somewhere that's not each puberty, 12, 13 years old. Those are youth. After that, you're young men and young women. But Christianity it says no. We didn't create this area called youth because they're they're not they're, they're not smart enough to make adult decisions. Well, yes, you are. The creation gave you the the right to exist, the right to live, the right to breathe, and the right to make decisions. So everything that you were taught prior to coming of age was was meant to to make you into that adult. But that's what the churches took away. That's what society took away. You know, um, I, I, even in IOC, I know you guys have a, most of you guys have a youth program in that. And I just shake my head and say, well, I don't want to participate in any of that crap. Because that conflicts so much with how I see the world, how I want my grandsons to be in the world. They're, they're, they're men. They're, they're, when they come of age, they're men. They're not youth. They're men. They have the right to, to all the rights of what young men go through in that. They're, they don't know anything, so that's where the training begins. But you're training men, you're not training youth. You know, I, I would encourage them to not accept that word youth. Um. So, so Lee, when, when we think about, you know, why it has happened, what has happened? Uh, I'm sorry, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when we, when we think about why it has happened, what has happened, uh, you know, what does hope look like now? How do we bring change for this next generation on an individual, local and community level? You always have to have hope, regardless of everything. Because if you if you didn't have any hope, then then why are you here? You know, creation. And if you want to call God, call him God. You know, that's what you're, you're familiar with. Uh, gave you gave you wishes of what they want to do. In in traditional beliefs, um, long time ago, they would say when when a person when somebody is born. Creation says, this is my what I'd like you to do in this life. So we have an idea of when we're born of what we're going to be doing in life. We're born in the community and that the community says, well, no, that's really not what, or what we want you to be. This is what we want you to be. No. We want you to believe what we believe. You don't need to touch it, just believe what we want, what we believe. And you get to this age of puberty. Puberty is a very important time because there's a real transition. And how it's explained to me is it, it's like a light switch in, in, your, in your brain here. Um, once you get puberty, you got to turn that switch on because then you step away from that idea of being you, a youth, a child, and you become a, a young adult. Well, at that time, a lot of, a lot of, um, I believe a lot of First Nations, when they come to that age, their influence has been so, is, is different, it's been tarnished. You know, culture has been taken away. Everything else has been taken away. But they still believe, and if they think deep enough, they still think about what creation wants them to do. And they say, well, you know, if I can't be who I really wanted to, was supposed to be, I certainly don't want who, who this community wants me to be. I'm going to become this. So what is this? This is whatever. In, in my community, this is somebody who, who, who maybe is struggles with alcohol or with drugs. Or they start using their bodies for sex. Those things that, that they, they can use to make money or, or, or find a, a level of, of acceptance. So, uh, 
you know, when you, uh, I think you're, in your CTV interview, you had mentioned this, this idea of, uh, you know, believing versus thinking where you said, uh, you know, believing is believing and, uh, and sorry, thinking is thinking and uh, believing is not thinking. Uh, could you share a little bit more around that also? Okay. Well, yeah, uh, thinking and believing are, are, are not congruent to each other. They, they're two separate things. When mm -hmm. you're, think, you're actually thinking about information you're being fed, you're thinking about that. Does that fit within what, what I believe or, or doesn't? You know? Um, and, and that's when we, we become critical thinkers. And being thinking critically is not a bad thing. Now, when we become believers, without thinking, there lies the problem. There lies the challenge, not the problem, but there lies the challenge. Because you're kind of believing what's being fed to you, information that's being fed to you, and you don't question it. Mm -hmm. You only go, go to church every Sunday without question. Why? Because my, my family did. You know, we did this for generations. And I'm gonna I'm gonna follow this way. Why? Because my family did. This is what we did. You know, not question whether it's it's a healthy choice or if it's right or if it's based creating more oppression or what it's just what you believe. So you always have to ask the question, why do I believe what I believe? And I think a lot of us that are sitting here, you know, we, we, we go into those times in the morning where you know they call it quiet time. But it's what it is, you know, to try to, to say, you know, spirit has talked to me this way and that. And I, I agree it happens, but we also have to question, is it fit into what I believe or am I just repli uh, replicating what's been told to me? And I know from my experience when I felt with Sama Deva, and they used to try to make me do these quiet times. It was always steeped with, a, with a, a caveat, you know, that this is the way Christians do it. Oh, and Muslims do it that way too, and Hindus do it that way too. But did they really do it the same way? And I don't think so. so I, I never quite believed that. It's like, well, well, what was my framework for belief? My belief came from what was, what was, um, Everybody else sitting there in quiet, so I better believe what they're doing. So I have a quiet time too. Kind of was it was a bit odd for me. Yeah, and I was just a young kid. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for. Sorry, please question, go ahead. Yeah, it made me question belief, and mm. in in my lived like lived life experiences, belief was based on. I challenge, I, I guess in the end I say I'm challenged with this. Why, why, why I became all of these things that you list that I was in my life. I didn't really get to do all those things. Um, when I became chief for my nation in that, you know, it was because I, I felt that it was time to, to um, just have a fresh pair of eyes look at things on our nation. To create those changes that, that I thought were positive, but it was based on on who my advisors were, they were all women. My advisors were all women because they carry the, the generations forward. When I ran for national chief, I carried that same vision because that is just what I believe. You know, and I had a lot of talks with so many chiefs in that. And you know, I, I did well, obviously I didn't win, but a lot of the chiefs spoke message me after the fact and they said, you know. Chief Coach, all the things he says, he really, um, it, it holds true in that. However, we have to vote as blocks and we can't stray from that. Now, and I was um, thankful for that. But I also asked him, say, well, why, you know, why didn't you step out of, out of that comfort zone and really create change? But, anyways, that's what happened. Um, and the things that I do now, and then I was interviewed by, by a super B news uh, Hope and then on um, a couple of other things. And I'm just saying, this is what I believe and this is how I see the world. And I'm open to, to people to be critical of it because I invite critical thinking. You know, I might not agree with you, but 
thinking, you know, you're, you're evolving as a human being. And how, how can I, how can I be any better than that? So that's why thinking and believing are so different. Um, thank you for sharing that, Lee. Uh, uh, I I just like to take a, a couple of minutes to you know uh, just summarize some of the things that you've shared. Uh, uh, thank you for that insightful session and for opening our minds to the other side of this uh, perspective. Uh, you know some of the things you shared around. Uh, you know, this intergenerational trauma that is still there, these effects that are still remaining. Uh, you know, there is so much to consider and reflect on today. Uh, the conventional dominant narrative ignores so many of these important issues, uh, you know, that have deeply affected, affected the indigenous peoples, not just in Canada, but across the world. Um, this significant, uh, you know, event of the Pope coming to Canada to apologize for the residential schools and the imp importance of the uh, decisions we make today, you know, we cannot, we have to be responsible and we cannot ignore this moment. Um, and uh, because this will really affect future generations to come. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there is a lot of uh, churning in our audience going on right now in terms of uh, okay, you know, how do we potentially bring out the necessary change? Uh, so this, this session had me thinking on a few different levels in terms of, uh, you know, this, uh, this idea of thinking versus believing and, uh, you know, the, the idea of constantly questioning our assumptions, even though there are uh, thoughts that we have in our quiet time. Uh, but I think, uh, there is this this quote that or this 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 post that a friend of mine Jesse Sutherland she had posted recently that comes to mind is we have a choice now in terms of do we want to replicate these systems or do we want to innovate for better systems uh, so with that question for this community I would like to thank uh, the Hopfest team for giving us this opportunity you know uh, for Lee to share his experiences. Uh, and Elizabeth for doing an amazing job at, you know, the translation piece. Uh, and, you know, my co-facilitator, Joy Newman, uh, and IFC Canada, without whose, uh, you know, care and support, this session wouldn't have been possible. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to open the floor for questions. If anyone has questions, please raise your hand using the reactions button on the control panel or you know you can unmute yourself and speak uh, so i leave the floor open to everyone for questions thank you uh, yes chris please go ahead uh, good morning, uh, Lee. I'm most grateful for all you've shared. I, I just want to say that my wife and myself are here in Canada because your father wrote a letter uh, inviting us to come and make our home here. And we've always that. been grateful for that and um, for the interactions over the years that we've had. During the Pope's visit to Canada, I wrote to Mark Miller, the Honorable Mark Miller, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, and we had a back and forth during the Pope's visit because he urged the Pope to rescind the document of discovery. Uh, I wrote back to him and said, that I hope that Canada government would work behind the scenes with the Holy See to work on rescinding this document. I was grateful that the Pope did acknowledge genocide on the plane going home. And what I would like to ask is, those of us involved over the years with initiatives of change, MRA, 
which um, we have that common link. Um, what can we do to accelerate this process of change now? Okay, that's a, that's a really big question, Chris. Um, I don't know if I necessarily have, the, have an answer for that, but I, I, you know, the, the question you asked, I, I've heard that many times when initiatives have changed, what can we do? I never really had a, a, a strong answer for that. Because answers can be prescriptive. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think that you talked about my dad, what my, what my father had done for both you and Anne. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that time, actually. Mm -hmm. I think that what I would do is I, I would appreciate if, if okay, say my, my grandson's come of age and they they and you meet them in that that they're that they're good enough men to to say to you, you know, thank you for for being who you were and are. Because you know, now it's my turn to make ensure that your that that your well being has been taken care of because this is the legacy of what my father or their great great grandfather has left for them. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be an answer there if, you know, because we have to remember the memories of, of, of things that happened that were very helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, my dad. Despite things that happened in residential school, he became who he was, and you know who he was. You know? mm -hmm. and that was a, that was a, a learning that he learned from his father, my grandfather and grandmother. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and where that learning came from, it came in the times of war and uh, the Indian Wars. When my great great grandfather fought against the Northwest Mounted Police, and and the grassroots beliefs that came from that. That when, we, when treaty was signed, we got to look. We have to be, have, have a compassionate mind for those that don't know anything. So rather than saying what can we do as an as initiative of change, it's more about mm -hmm. honoring what has happened for you mm -hmm. than in in the land that you live on. Mm -hmm. You know what? You know, Chris and you guys have done magnificent work. Um, being those understanding people. So I don't know if it's about having a solution to say more about what can we do, but it's honoring, it's honoring the time that you've been on, on the land. Thank you. But, but, that, but that acknowledgement you did of my dad, I really appreciate that. Well, it means an awful lot to, to me and Anne, and it, it, it is what spurs our actions here in Canada to right the wrongs of history. And I'm always conscious that I'm British by birth, but Canadian by choice. And um, the responsibility of living in this land um, is a great responsibility. And um, thank you, uh, Lee. Mm. Uh, John, would you like to ask your question? Please go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, I really appreciate hearing what you've been saying, Lee. Um, I, I am both British and Australian. And uh, uh, for 10 years, I was the Secretary of Australia's National Sorry Day Committee. Yeah. Um, we, we worked to bring change against uh, a very hostile government. Um, and we roused a million people into action uh, to the government's astonishment and continued on for 10 years, by which time the attitudes in Parliament had changed so much that we got a unanimous apology in 2008. Um, yeah. to, but uh, it, was a, it was a tough struggle and uh, a lot of people came from, from uh, a number of people came from Canada and helped us. 
uh, Maggie Hodgson came and she 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 brought a really well she was really helpful in the ideas that she brought and then Phil Fontaine came uh, with Charlene Below and Kathleen Mowney uh, they made a big impression too they um, the former prime minister organized some very important events for them and uh, and we had some significant event. anyway it, it, Canada played quite a part in the whole way that we fought the struggle. But um, you've got to look at these things in, in a long term. The apology was a big step forward for Australia um, and a unanimous apology and $5 billion into dealing with the, the terrible housing, the terrible lack of education, uh, lack of employment, um, health. Uh, so, but uh, it's an ongoing struggle. Um, now, what, what is what is the next step? I mean, I know what what they're fighting for. Uh, the Aboriginal people are fighting for in Australia. Um, it's it's a treaty, and and I think they'll get there. Um, New Zealand, New Zealand took the step of inviting the Queen to come and apologise, um, because of course Britain, where where I am, I'm speaking from Oxford. Britain plays a huge part in all this history. Um, you, you know, what are the next steps in Canada on a, on a, on a national scale, um, which may take time, but this whole issue that you've raised with the Pope is also surely an issue which has to be raised with the colonial countries, uh, Britain, France, and so on. Um, wh what, is, what is the new thinking? There is new thinking coming, um, you know, for instance, uh, our responsibility of slavery was, was never on the agenda until about sort of, I'd say, 10, 20 years ago. Now, now it is. Now, now we have editorials in our newspaper saying we have to pay compensation for slavery. Uh, so, so new thinking comes. Um, uh, what is the step that you would like Britain to take in this, in this matter? Um, which could help bring a new thinking. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, how do you overcome, when, when you speak of the legacy of colonialism in people's minds, um, what will free that? Okay. All right. So, um, you know, thanks for that question, Josh. Um, I'm going to relate something that was taught to me. And it was this this whole thing, and the English translation means making woke. That's that's what the ceremony is called, making woke. And just to break it down now, we all know what a wolf looks like, you know, and we we, we admire wolves quite a bit, you know. Um, it's just there, it's in the narrative about wolves, but we forget that a wolf is also a wild animal. So just to keep that, that thought in mind. So this idea of making woke. I use the example of two nations that would fight each other. And on the prairies, of, you know, the most common one is Blackfoots and Crees, two different nations. And they would have a battle. And that battle was done and everybody sort of went their own, you know, separated. And the time of cooling off was there. In time, one chief, one or the other would, would, would um, get his emissary. His emissary is what we would call a tobacco runner. Tobacco runner carried, because tobacco is kind of important on the prairies, with the prairie people. Tobacco is kind of an important uh, conduit, I guess is the word. Um, and he'd give his, his, own, his own pipe, the, the, the small pipes on the, on the prairies. And he'd give it to his, his emissary and say, go over to that next nation, wherever they are, and say, we, we got to come together and we got to talk about the battle. Well, that emissary was in a very precarious position. They had to be very brave because they could get killed on sight by, by the, other the other nation's um, scouts. But if he got accepted, he brought in and went to go see the chief, and the chief accepted those, those, those items. And they, and they would smoke the pipe, share it, then you go back, okay, we're going to meet. This is where they would create a war lodge. 
Now there's another word for warlock, but that's not important at the moment here. The idea is this warlock was created. So both sides would come together. And in this war lodge, they would have their own in their on their own nation in their own nation. They would have their own protocols, their own ceremonial protocols going on. They wouldn't share anything. They would just acknowledge that, and they're all sitting in this space. Once protocols were finished, in that then the, narr the narration begins. One one person would stand up, and they talk about the battle. They say, "In this battle, this is this is how I made my war deeds." You know, I, I, I killed one en enemy over there and I touched that, that enemy over there. Then they would sit down and the other side would get up and say, that, yeah, that's what happened. You know, that person killed was my best friend. And I saw you touch my, my uncle because touching the enemy was, was very, was much, which was much more important just to touch the enemy. Um, and, so the, and so everybody would, would, would um, talk about that war that battle going on there. And this is where the making wolf comes in there. Because um, they've talked about the battle. Okay, now what do we do? So the conclusion was either we don't need to fight this, this battle anymore, it's done. Or no, there's there's something more. I'm, I'm a little bit still ticked off at what happened now. Let's go outside and fight some more. So you had two outcomes. But the result was the truth was told and both sides could say, this is the truth. So now both sides can go back to wherever they are and they can carry on that conversation and talk about the truth. And a, a prime example is on my nation, so Dina, um, we had a battle with the Crees up in this place called um, Kutnight, Saskatchewan. Kutnight. But in that battle, um, we talked about that. It was, it was in our stories for years. And, and in, in um, on, on Palmaker's land, it was their story as well. So finally, they came down because they actually defeated us. They came down and they and they talked about the battle and they and they and they played out the whole the whole scenario. And he says, "What we're going to do now is there's there's two acres here on this reserve that is forever going to be known as Sutina's land. Whatever you guys want to do with it, it's your land." So there was the acknowledgement of the story. That was the validation of that, of that battle. So what do we do with it? Well, we don't know yet, but we know that the truth was told. So now that, that whole idea of this making wolf, let's bring it into present day. And in present day, again, we talked about treaty. You know, we, we, we signed a treaty, we're not gonna kill anybody and everything. And the government says, well, that's really good. You know, Thank you for that. But you know, we're, we're gonna hold on to this treaty and the treaty represents knowledge. It represents our culture. I'll use the metaphor of a horse. The horse represents all of that. We're gonna hold on to your horse for you. But here, this is what we're gonna use. And this is, this is a policy. And this policy is called the Indian Act. And in the Indian Act, it's gonna list how we're gonna, how we're gonna take care of you. The, the keywords is how we're gonna take care of you. Because now you're creating this this um, this word of the state mentality. So how are we going to take care of all these Indians we signed a treaty with? Well, we're, we're going to give them warmth. So we'll give them blankets. We won't tell them that those blankets are filled with smallpox, but we'll give it to them anyways to keep warm. So that's how they they killed lots of people with smallpox. Yeah. And then after a while, it became well, you know, we agreed that we should educate their children. So. We'll, we'll create these residential schools. So until they get a, great, a grade eight education, we're, we're gonna be committed to that. You know, some guys are really old, like they're 18 and they aged out and, st and they just can only get a quick grade eight. And then as time went on, they had to do, you know, things weren't quite working the way it was. So they create this, what they call the 60s scoop. They scoop a whole bunch of kids, sent them all over the country all over the world. The intention was to get the Indian out of it. Become more like us. But the but I mean it was not so much to make them prosper like everybody else, but to make them servants. Because the rewards of the state they're servants. They're, they're not equal. But in, in in God's way we're doing our job. 
And then that came a time when there was, uh, our leadership said, we need much more education than what you're feeding us with grade eight education. And so they started raising a ruckus. And the government said, well, we can't do anything because under Indian Act, we only, we're only obligated up to grade eight. So they thought about it and said, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll raise the age of this idea of youth up to 18. So once we use that word youth, then we can give you funding up to grade 12. Well, people got there soon enough. Well, we want more. Well, the old university, well, geez, you know, that's kind of tough. Okay, we'll increase the age of youth there to 21. And then it became 25. And then it became 29. Nowadays it's 35. So this whole idea of youth to create this, this level of, of, uh, of, of, of um, wardship. So, you know, wards of the state, they created that. And then people have graduated, they got the degrees, they got the, the, the engineers, they're there, the lawyers, they're the teachers and that. You know, and government says, well, you've done really good. You know, here's your horseback. And it's, it's not treaty, but it's your knowledge. So all our people are talking to that, to that knowledge or to that horse. But the horse is not saying anything. It's just standing there. And they say, what the heck? You know, it's your, our knowledge. You know, help us. And it's just standing there. And yet the horse saying, you know, ask me what to do and I'll do it for you. I'm, I'm listening. But the ability to talk to that knowledge has been kind of taken away. So that, that's the struggle. Now, on that side of the battle, that was all based on racism and ignorance. Everybody that was on that side, everybody that signed a tree on that side, you're either it was because of the racist acts or you're ignorant to all of it. Because the government did what you needed. So we, you know, so there's our ignorance. We don't have to question everything. We just believe what, what we're being fed. But there's two sides to every battle. So what's our story on our side? And this is kind of how I've summed it up. When we touch that pen and that we create that, that, that way, we agree we're, we're not going to give up anything, but we're, we also agree we're not going to kill anybody. So we're going to honor that. We're not going to kill anybody. But then all of these things are happening. And people are saying, well, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't do that, you know. So, but we can't fight you, we can't kill you. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna use our, our weapon. Our weapon is our bodies. We're gonna use alcohol, we use drugs, we're gonna use sex, we're gonna do all these things. But if they want us to be a ward of the state, well, I'm gonna make sure they pay for that to be a ward of the state. So that's how we fought back with our bodies. You know, now our side, because we can never be racist, but we can certainly be prejudiced. And we're really good at being prejudiced because it's based on anger, it's based on all these things. And so the, the, that's the story. And now we've jumped to, to truth and reconciliation. Everybody wants to get to reconciliation, but nobody wants to talk about the truth. Yeah. So it, to, in a roundabout way of what you're asking, John, is we need, to, we need to talk about the truth of what actually happened. We don't need to say sorry just yet. We just need to acknowledge what our role is. And sometimes our role is ignorance. We need to address our ignorance. Yes, I mean in Australia, we have, the ten years were spent in in educating the country about the truth, uh, and yes, uh, there's a lot more truth yet to come out. But at yes. least at least the truth of the stolen generations came out. But uh, I mean, do you think that there needs to be uh, indigenous universities? Only if you're going to teach from an indigenous lens or indigenous perspective. Yes. Because if you if you're just creating a university, but you're you're spewing out the same stuff that 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 um, society deems deems important, then you know, just go to regular school. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John, for that that question, uh, Doctor Nagya. Uh, could you take your question next? We have a few more questions, so. Uh... Okay, I'll be brief. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I come from Egypt, and uh, I must admit that when we were young, we had the misconceptions about the Red Indians through the films, you know, the, the movies, 
and even at school, in primary school, we, we, I was in a, 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 originally a British school that ha, was nation, nationalized after the revolution and the independence. And we used to play uh, uh, cowboys and Indians. You see, we were influenced mm -hmm. by the media and the movies. And this was the game that we played during the break, cowboys and Indians. So this is one point that we, we need to understand and know better the truth. Because I think that the image of the in Red Indians or the natives or aboriginals was distorted in the movies for a long time. The other thing is when you mentioned the forgiveness and Pope Francis, well, uh, immediately came to my mind a verse in the Holy Quran that nobody is responsible for the sin of the other or the you are not burdened with the sin of the other so we cannot you know carry the the, the sin or burden of generations ago to nowadays uh, generations uh what happened in the past has happened of course truth has to come out and there has to be apology and the compensation but those who are living now are not responsible for what their ancestors have done. The third thing I remember when I was visiting Coventry uh, Cathedral in 1972, they had the old cathedral, uh, the ruins of the old cathedral kept as a reminder during World War II, what happened and the destruction. And the, there was the new cathedral and then there was the altar and, and the names from, from the, Old Cathedral, they made a cross and wrote, Father, forgive. You know, so I think forgiveness is really uh, very much honored by all faith traditions. And uh, uh, the, third, the second caliph, Omar ibn Khattab, was the companion of the Prophet, peace upon him, when, before he embraced Islam, when he was worshiping idols, he was different. But when he embraced Islam, he one time they found him crying and crying and crying, and another time laughing and laughing and laughing. So they said, why are you crying and why are you laughing? He said, I'm crying because my baby, the girl, was born, and because of the wrong traditions, I buried her life in the sand. So I was crying because I killed my own child. And he was laughing because he was wor worshipping an idol made of dates, and when he got hungry, he ate it. Imagine. So, I mean, change, we believe in change and transformation and forgiveness. And I hope that God will forgive us all for all our sins and we always start afresh. But we have to acknowledge the past and uh, reveal the truth. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, and I appreciate that comment because, you know, um, we're all trying to find the truth. You know, um, yes. We were, it didn't happen, not on our watch, but it happened before all those actions are, are created. But in order to kind of address that, we got to find it, our own truth. And where we fit into that. Um, I, I believe, Joy, you're going to be speaking next. But just before you start, we had a question in the chat uh, that I'd like to share here. Uh, uh, Credum, if you want to uh, uh, speak your question, uh, please unmute yourself and speak. Uh, Freedom, are you there? Okay. Okay. Yes, I am. Um, I was being asking um, because of these uh, wrong stories uh, uh, have been wrote for years, and uh, and the people has been taught this. Uh, now, how is it possible to uh, to correct these uh, these fake stories of uh, the colonialism, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I'm kind of trying to reframe the question a little bit here. Um, how do we correct the wrongs? Is that kind of what the, the question was? How do we correct the wrongs? How, how to correct uh, these wrong stories? Who has been already uh, taught? 
Okay. All right. Okay. You know, um, we, we talk about, yeah, I mean, we talk about global change, you know, global realities. Well, one of the real big realities is, is climate change. You know, some would say it's an anomaly and things like that. But what's really important is in this change, you know, the earth is always going to change. Whether man contributed to that or, or whether it was just natural, I don't know. But we get, I mean, we humble ourselves to, to what the land is saying. And we, and for us, it's Mother Earth. We humble ourselves to that, you know. We, we, we're doing a very poor job of that. But everything that we throw in the garbage and everything that's in the oceans and that, that's actually from, from Mother Earth herself. So that, that's her own stuff. You know? um, we, we just kind of messed it up that way. So sometimes it's stepping away from a belief system of what your, your religious belief is. And that's hard for 99% of people to do is step away from that. In, in the way that I see in the world, in the way that I, I love to believe in that, that life comes from everything. Everything, everything has a song from the rocks to the plants to the air. There's always a song. And when we go into our seminal times, we sing those songs. And, that, and that, that's, the, that's the reality for us. That's not something that's new age or made up, it's a truth. And that yesterday I was talking to um, to um, Chase there, and talked about um, the month of April. And my language is Paskashi Chapa. Well, that's the month of April. That's the month when the frogs sing. This year the, they didn't sing until the middle of May, and that's unusual. And it had me a little bit concerned because my cousin had told me years ago. He says, you always got to listen for those frogs in the spring. Because when, when they sing, what they're saying to you, if you're listening, is that life, the, the ecosystem that they're living in, that, that little biosphere, that it's healthy. It, you know, it, it, there's challenges, but it's healthy. So he would say, once those frogs stop singing, then human, humanity has to be really prepared to not be here anymore. Because frogs are your environmental indicators because they're so sensitive to, to environmental change. So, we, so when you're asking the question in that, sometimes it, it, it's not human generated answers or human generated um, actions that we have to do. It's simply listen to what the land says. I'm not sure where you're from. But it's going out there and in your quiet time, go sit there and just listen to what the land is saying to you. And I think that I think that's where you start. And that's just my belief. You don't have to believe it. Um, but th that's how I, I do things. You know, I'm thankful for everything that, that gives me permission to stay alive, to breathe in the next breath. Um. Thank you, Lee, for sharing that. We have one more question uh, from Joy from Nigeria. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Thank you so much. Um, just want to say it's good to be here. I wanted to listen to this conversation because I'm a student of history. And I read about the Mayans and loved the Mayans and the great civilization they brought to the world, but it was really unfortunate. And then that's why, um, you know, the, to the question, why do we believe what we believe? And I was just going to on what um, um, Lee said about thinking is not thinking, believing is not, you know, thinking is thinking, believing is not thinking. And it just goes to show that what is belief? Belief is a story that was handed down. At the time, we didn't have a choice, so we believed. As a student of history, at the time I was in, in, in university, there were some courses, the stories of civilizations of people that I was too biased with. So I was looking at it from the angle of bias. But when I began to think, 
when I started thinking and analyzing, I realized that perhaps it wasn't just um, one-sided. You know, it was a, it wasn't this a, a, a one-sided story. It was the flip side. Something must have happened for that to dominate, and that's what colonialism is all about. So that's actually what brings me to the question, and that is, how do we intentionally refuse to pass an old story? How do we intentionally refuse to do that? And for me, I think it starts with the power of advocating for a new story, because there is power in advocating for a new story. If we keep passing this new story, perhaps with time, it would heal the wounds, because these are wounds of the past. Everybody has said the same thing. We cannot keep living in that. Yeah, I know that I'm speaking it because sometimes it is said that when you, you're not part of the pain, you, you, you gloss over it. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just saying, it has happened, but we have to, how do we intentionally walk over it so that we don't keep passing this, this pain to the new generation? And I'm saying that the power of advocating is, for me, the best place to start. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, th thank you very much for that. I, I really appreciate those words, Matt. Um, you're right. How do we, ch how do we challenge that? You know, even in, in where, I, where I'm from and that, um, I do challenge our traditional people on, on thinking what they think. And that, you know, it gets me in a lot of trouble, to be quite honest. Um, you know, so people um, tend to keep their distance from me in terms of, of, of ceremonial practices and that. And, and, and that's fine because I'm still asking the question, why do you believe that way? Why do you believe what you believe? You know, that's always been at the core of my existence and because that's what my, my dad taught me. That's what my, my grandfather and especially my grandmother, she, she really taught me that. I think because they, they had gone through that full residential school experience and, and they saw the ugliness of it and they see the ugliness of what happens there across the, the, the world, you know, the oppression of, of people killing each other just simply so they can believe in this doctrine of discovery. What I, I you know, to the victor go to the spoils. At whatever cost, most places is at the cost of life. You know, we'll, we'll kill you and you'll kill us. So, I, um, I, I, I'm agreeing wholeheartedly with what you just said there. Uh, it is a challenge. I don't have an answer either, but I'll tell you every day, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking, what, why do I believe what I believe? And I like to believe in the goodness of humanity. That's why I have all of you as my friends still, because humanity, um, all, all of you sitting there, you, you show me a glimpse of what, of what humanity is like because there's a lot of times when I'm when I'm when I'm wavering too and I just want to go out there and you know blaze of glory to to kill as many as I could. You know that, that that's how extreme it can be for me. My my rational mind says, well no you can't do that. Dude. That's that's just plain stupid. But in my in my passionate times that that's well what else can I do? You know, well, since the pandemic, in my own community, my own family, as of two days ago, I've lost 49 nation of my of my family. You know, a few of them to COVID itself, the rest from the effects of what COVID did to them, the isolation, the marginalization, all those things. You know, that's just in three years, I lost 49 of my own relatives. That's not including everybody else, it's just my own relatives. You know, I have um, some nephews from one family. They're all gone now. You know, they, they, they did have children there, but they're, all those children don't have fathers. The full generation got wiped out because they were marginalized in my community. They didn't come from a prominent family. They came from a family that you know, was marginalized. So our leadership kind of just sort of, oh, well, you know, they're gone. What am I going to do? So there's the struggle. 
Well, thank you for that comment. I really appreciate that one. Um, thank you, Lee. Uh, on that note uh, of, you know, why do we believe what we believe? Uh, I'd like to thank Lee again, uh, Chief Lee Crowchild for, you know, uh, being part of this session and sharing your truth. Uh, uh, I think, you know, there is a, there is a huge potential for re-evaluating and, and, you know, re-innovating systems that are in place today. Uh, and I think each of us needs to reflect on and think back, you know, how are we propagating some of these systems? And, you know, is there a way in which we could uh, really take this up uh, in our own agency in terms of trying to implement new systems or questioning systems where, where as and when we can? Um, I'd also like to thank the Hopfest team for giving us this opportunity and the Circles of Indigenous Worldviews team in Canada, uh, the IFC Canada team, again, uh, without whom this, this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, and thank you all for, you know, whoever of you have attended. Uh, if you have any further questions or would like to get in touch with us around some of these, uh, um, around these topics, uh, Joy has recently shared, uh, you know, our emails in the chat. Uh, if you would like to get in touch, please do write to us about it. Um, if you have any other questions or any other thoughts, uh, you know, please share them on email or you can even uh, get in touch with the Hopfest team and you can get it through them. And on that note, uh, I'd like all of us to, you know, take two minutes of quiet time of just reflecting on what we have heard right now before we close the session. Let's just take two minutes of quiet time. Thank you.